right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, uh, two things before we get started with this. Uh, when Brian and I were putting uh, some ideas of what he had asked me to talk about, uh, there were two things that some of you uh, who were in my session yesterday, uh, I focus a lot on the people. Data is great, but if I can't use it to impact action, it's not useful. So yesterday we talked about how do you install this? How do you take all of these great ideas and implement it? And so in uh, July, I'm also hosting a two-day workshop to train people to implement, run teams, because I think that's really a big missing part of a lot of dealerships. The people who are running teams in your dealership have the least amount of training. It's fascinating to me. But what we're doing now is you're going to have all these great ideas. You're going to go back and you're going to try some things. So I said to Brian, well, instead of just loading everybody up with a lot of great ideas, sending them on their way, what if we found some people that have already gone through it and said, would you be willing, and I applaud these four people, <laughs> for being willing to stand up here and say, I messed up a few things. I wish I knew something better. Boy, if I was doing it again today, I'd start here to save you time. And so that's really what we're trying to accomplish. We're going to talk about five different areas of this whole process. Because, again, you can have the best tool, but if you haven't thought it through, I use the... Uh, uh, sort of imagery of the octopus. If you don't go all the way through and follow it all the way through, not just I have a tool. Yesterday we had a discussion in my session, the wording, installation, implementation, two separate concepts, but actually people talk about it the same way. I installed it, but that just doesn't mean, hey, I train people and we're done. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the tool. How did you come up with the tool that you chose? How did that installation process go? So when you're talking to a vendor, what's your responsibility? Your responsibility to ask that vendor to make sure our installation works. Then the implementation, how did you deal with your staff? How did you win them over? What were your struggles? Fourth, we're going to talk about marketing. How did you let people know that this tool was even there? How did you sell it to your customer base that this was valuable to them? And then ultimately, which we all want, is what, what are the results? So that's what we're going to talk about, and then we'll give you some time to be able to ask the question. So um, I think your microphone's there. Uh, first, again, thank you so much for being up here. If you just introduce yourself, and then we'll start from there. Uh, good morning. I'm Todd Caputo I'm with the Sun Auto Group in uh, Syracuse, New York. Good morning. Mike Gruber with Paul Miller Auto Group in northern New Jersey. Good morning, uh, Gino Walsh, Cavalli Auto Group. We're from uh, Florida, Texas, and California. Jared Kilway with Jermaine Automotive, both stores in Ohio and Florida. Great. So, first question is, before we even talk about the tool, I'd like all of your input on this. Why? Why did you even start this ahead of everyone else, theoretically? Why did you say this is important? to my business, to my customers, what was the impetus that made you say, I have to go do this? Why don't you start talking? Um, I don't want to be Sears. I don't want to be J.C. Penney's. I don't want to be Toys R Us. I don't want to be Dress Barn that just announced that they're closing 420 stores this morning. Uh, I don't want to be a victim of online retailers that could potentially uh, sell all my customers' car and uh, I instill that in my entire staff. I'm a dealer, and uh, it starts with me. And I realized that if we didn't change what we were doing, um, we'd be out of business within three to five years. And people look at me cross-eyed, and some people believe me. Some people thought I was nuts. Um, and those that believe stayed, and those that didn't believe, her, they're gone. So that's why I did it. Okay. We did it for customer experience. I mean, we constantly asked our customers feedback about what they want. And starting about eight years ago, they wanted to simplify the buying process and the service process. They thought they were both too cumbersome. They thought they, they both took too long. They weren't transparent enough. So uh, we were looking for ways to simplify it and make the experience better. Okay. I, I hate paper and Sharpies and smiley faces. That's probably one of the biggest reasons why I did it. No, actually, we, we wanted to have a point of sale in the store. 
Right. And for me, how I looked at it, it was, if I can have a DR tool, it better be able to be used in store as the point of sale. And uh, that's where a lot of the energy came from us. So ours started actually, um, which is great that you guys have been talking about it all week, is the branded name of how to kind of rebrand uh, the Germain name with Rich Germain. Taking customer feedback, what do they want, how do they want to do business with us, you know, we took that information and listened to it. So that was kind of the initial point of us starting with digital retailing moving forward. So while you have the mic, Jared, talk about the tools, all right? So you guys were early to this. How many tools did you go through? How did you choose? I also want to know what tool you're using right now, so everyone knows. But how did you go through that uh, process of choosing the tool, deciding what tool's right for your culture? Um, we tried this, it didn't work. You know, how, how did you land on what you're doing now? So we've had between six stores, we've had eight tools in the past 26 months. So um, a lot of the change, some of it's OEM mandated change with a lot of adjustments that certain vendors we can no longer use. So certain pieces were OEM mandated, um, but then certain pieces we've actually now selected. So you have to really figure out what do you want out of the tool. Are you looking for online only? Are you looking for more of an in-store sales process? Are you kind of looking for that hybrid? You know, both because no store is going to be the same. No store operates the same way. So you have to kind of find that equal medium. So that's why we have different solutions at our different locations based upon OEM and how the customers operate. Um, so we're using Tagrail at two stores. We're using uh, True Payments. We're using we were on Accelerate, that came off, um, just due to some integration pieces with them. And then we're using a company out the Toyota store in Florida, which is Prodigy, um, both online and in-store, and biggest piece with them is the integration. Okay. Seamless. So, um, Michael, which, so how did you choose the tool that you're using right now? We, um, we have a painful process, that we have 12 stores, and um, they range from you know, so and Volkswagen and Bentley and Rolls Royce, so it was hard to uh, one size fits all. And um, we needed a, a vendor that was going to be objective and that, that was going to adjust as we were learning and making changes. And uh, we're still going through this; we're still making mistakes. Uh, but we needed to find a, a vendor partner that was uh, agile, that was willing to adjust. And there was a lot of weeding out in that process. Our BMW store was kind of the pilot for it, and uh, they used uh, the car now buy now product because. Right. Uh, well, because they were flexible and they were willing to work with us. Okay. We have other solutions and other rooftops, but um, that's the key is flexibility and agility. So, Todd, to the, the, the vendor partners out here who are now talking to dealers, what's your recommendation, meaning what was your, what was your win when you were talking to vendors? What were your struggles with vendors to get them to understand what you needed? And to your point, Michael, how flexible were they? So if we have dealers here and they're talking to a lot of these the vendor partners out here, what should the dealer be asking to make sure that that tool is right for you? Well, uh, my situation is really unique because of the fact that I have a Chevy store right. and two independent used car stores. And with my used car stores, I can do whatever I want to do, however I want to do it, which is quite nice, to be honest with you. Um, to answer your first question, though, um, we started with Online Shopper from Dealer Inspire, which was a great tool, um, which got us a lot of leads. Um, and then we tried a tool from eLead that uh, we used for a very short period of time, and then ultimately um, we're using Roadster now. And one of the biggest challenges we had with all three was um, how they uh, how they connected with the CRM. Um, that was, I think, probably the biggest challenge, um, and it's a challenge that we still go through uh, today. And I mentioned the other day when I spoke uh, the other morning that um, we're considering getting rid of our CRM altogether um, because it's not playing well with uh, right. with Roadster because Roadster has a I wouldn't call it a full blown CRM, but it, there's enough in the back end of it for uh, my advisors to. Um, you know, to, to interact with any customer that's interested in buying a car um, when they're in when they're shopping to right. actually buy it. So the CRM is probably was the biggest challenge for us. Right. Okay. So Gino, along that lines, 
So if we, we've chosen our tool, you guys have all had varied tools, you can talk about the tools that you have. Um, we, we've now, Todd has shared with some questions you should be asking. Talk about that first installation, right? Vendor installation, we'll get to the people on your team in a minute, but that first interaction of installation, customer service, how did we get, was it you driving it? Was it them driving? Well, how did that work? And again, what do they need to know so when they start this step, they're prepared? Yeah, well, for us, we don't delegate any of our implementation, so I actually was there for the first customer experience, so to speak. Um, we used Darwin Automotive, um, and it was literally on happenstance because I looked at so many different DR tools. Um, all of them had really good uh, UI. They were, you know, it looked right, um, but ultimately the way that Darwin set up is they started with the journey at the end, which is having somebody sign a contract and go through the menu presentation, and then they built their system back from there. So in my mind's eye, I was like, well, if I can get them faster to that, that's where I want to go. Right. And so our first implementation was our San Francisco store, our oldest store, 70 years, 1947 British motor cars. And, uh, you know, our first experience with a customer, and not on the DR side, but on the point of sale side, uh, was a cash deal on a $140,000 SBR uh, Range Rover Sport. And, of course, uh, Bob's in the room. He was there with me. And I was like, oh, man, a cash deal? The first deal I'm going to do on this is going to be a cash deal? Uh, and I just, you know, became really vulnerable to the process and just went out there and did everything that we thought was going to work and, and wound up turning it into a uh, four-product cash deal and the customer purchased a $5,700 warranty. And right after that, I was like, well, this worked, and right. uh, and I started implementing it at the other stores. Um, but you have to really have some operational commitment from your, your staff. Right. So that's probably the number one thing that I can tell you from a uh, experience. Um, when somebody's not into it, or there's other what we call um, invisible horses pushing against it, because the invisible world controls the visible world. Right. And uh, if you don't, if you don't have people that are committed to this process then the cust no matter how great your branding image is, no matter how great your tool is, when the customer comes into the dealership, it can be completely disjointed. And uh, they want it to fail sometimes because they have protection on, on what they want. You know, there's some positions of people, you know, a couple of our stores, we had to make some decisions as far as personnel is concerned. And uh, it wound up being better for us, uh, more profitable for us. But there's a lot of people that are in the store that are not overly excited about digital retail because it can fundamentally change the way in which they make income. Right. Well, that's a good, <clears throat> so that's a good segue to this next part, which is we have a tool. We've chosen it. We've found a partner that can help install it, get it all set up for us. And we'll come back to that because I want your opinions uh, later as we wrap up to the vendor community to say, what could you do better in our installation process to help us out? But now we're talking about our people which I personally think is, to your point, one of the biggest struggles, is this fundamentally could take away. There's some tools that say you can get rid of your F&I office. How's that going to ripple through, right? We can downsize. We can do this. We can make it easier. We don't have to negotiate anymore. What does that mean for some of your employees who are paid on certain aspects of what they can generate, and now you're taking that away from them? So, Jared, when you put in your tool and you how did you first sell it to your team and then we'll talk and then and michael i'd like to hear about how you got them to uh, uh you know do what you needed them to do so using the toyota store for reference um the night that we actually had a joint partnership with sct and they were launching a you know solution because sct knew it was so important so we had not only the backing of the Germain family, but also we had SET there. So literally, we had a five-day full-blown course where the only people that were actually selling cars for that time period were all the F&I managers, the desk managers. They were the ones handling it because all the salespeople were in this mandated training for that time period. So essentially, shut the store down for five days. Still, we're doing some transactions, but it was critical to making sure that it launched correctly. And the big thing with Prodigy is they are more in-store. Right. So it's tablet, 
in hand in that experience. And teaching salespeople how to use it is one thing, but how do you introduce the tablet to the consumer that's not the basis and in their face and kind of can be sometimes awkward. So you're teaching not only uses of a tool, what to do, how to click it, but you're teaching them how to stand, how to bring it into the equation with that customer as well. So it's really important from that side in store to make it concrete and streamlined so everybody knows what the expectations are. Right. And the big thing is what happens if those expectations don't happen? And we've gone through some personnel change from it. Mm -hmm. But what we have found now since November is the people who are using it, it's actually been a great benefit because we have salespeople who may be underperforming and not happy, but they don't want to leave because there's no other store in the market that has this technology right. and the tool. So we've actually found out it's a great piece for the sales rep retention. So, Michael, then, so, again, our goal here is advice. Dealers are going to stand in front of their team. They're going to talk about it. But what are the struggles? What are the obstacles? If you were sitting there right now for coffee and someone said, what do I have to be prepared for when I'm with my staff? Not just initially, to Jared's point, I had my nice session and yay, and everybody's going. What happens a month from now? What, what are the obstacles that everyone in this room say, watch out for this when you come to your staff? What would you say is they need to pay attention to, and what do you think is a solution to help them through it? I can only tell you what our experience was. It was uh, the biggest area, the biggest uh, mistake that we made was um, we, have a, we have a great situation. We have low turnover, a lot of tenure in our group. And uh, we went to the best internet salespeople, the best BDC reps, the best salespeople, and we tried to train them and get them engaged on the tool, and it failed miserably. It failed because they were getting incredible content. They were getting four different down payments and four different color variations and four different monthly payments, and they would say, this guy's all over the place. It was unbelievable, and it was happening with regularity. And then we would give it to the BDC reps, and they would try to make an appointment. That's where they wanted an appointment. And when we gave it to the best salespeople, they tried to sell, and of course they didn't want them to sell. So uh, we ended up, it, it evolved with where we are now, and that's why this uh, agility and flexibility is so important. Uh, delivery specialists, the uh, geniuses, they were the ones that were best suited for this because they created engagement. They didn't want to sell anything. So I, if I started again, I would skip that whole part of it. I wouldn't even make it available to anybody who has any type of tenure and, who's any, and who has had any type of success in the conventional selling process. I would go right to somebody who's just passionate about the brand and creating engagement. So that's that's what I would say. So yeah, same thing. Yeah, so our store in Lakeland. So we started with our oldest store, we started with our newest store, Audi Lakeland. And, and what we kind of coined the term, and Paul Gomez, he's our general sales manager there. So you need to have like an OCC, which is a omni-channel champion. Like if you have an omni-channel champion in the store and they're in their, you know, they're invested in the in the process working out, then you're going to see great success. And, and because of people like Paul and Ken, the general manager there, and, and Jared, it's a holistic approach to the consumer. Because on, on the end of it, the customer loves it. We're getting the best reviews from the customer. We're getting customers in and out of the store within less than an hour. You know, that wasn't even one of our goals originally. It was just to ease the process. Uh, but having an omni-channel champion in the store is probably one of the best things that you can do if you're going to implement a digital retailing process. Uh, because then they're going to ensure when the customer comes in how that process is going to work. Are we going to flip right to the Darwin F&I menu and do the validation state uh, stages? Are we uh, going to answer the Internet leads differently? Like, that's, that's a big one. You know, you can't treat a DR Internet lead the same as somebody looking for best price or somebody looking for a trade-in evaluation. So uh, if I was going to tell anyone, uh, the biggest thing to do is to have somebody who's in your management team that's there. If you're going to do the full digital retail process, that can become the omni-channel champion. So, Todd, for you, same sort of question. How did digital retailing change your in-store process, right? And how was that a struggle? Was it a struggle for your team to adapt? Was it easy? Because, again, to Gino's point is, we can talk about online, and Jared said the same thing. It's going to affect your in-store process. 
If we have a digital retailing tool, my theory is, is that, and we've talked to a few DR folks here, the, the amount of people who go through all of the, you know, the, all the way down to the bottom and submit is minimal. But if we don't think that everybody's going to touch the tool and use the tool and change our processes, we could be missing something. So what was the biggest change for you internally as a store for your process from that either transitioning from online to in-store or what you did for this, you know, to, to, to get to deliver that great seamless experience? What was your biggest struggle with your team? It's not a short answer. Um, but first, I got time. first of all, we went one price, and I don't think that you can uh, – do business online as a car dealer unless you're a one price store. Um, if you're going to buy something online, you have to know what the price is first. And if it's your best price first, um, that, that, that that's your promise, that's your brand promise, that you're buying the car and you can buy it online or buy it in showroom if you want to. Um, and that's the price that you're going to pay whether you are uh, a, a friend or relative or you never bought a car from us before. I don't think that um, this works unless you're one price. I don't. And second of all, uh, we don't look at it as a tool. Um, our express store, Roadster, is not a tool. It's who we are and how we do business. Um, it, it, how we train our automotive advisors is, is around the, the Roadster process. So when a customer is online and they're shopping at home or work or on the phone or tablet or computer, um, the same experience that they have online, they have the moment that they walk in the store. They can pick up where they left off um, in, in their shopping if they, if they save the car. Um, if they come into the store and they um, have chosen not to buy the car for whatever reason, um, maybe they need a, a spouse's approval or a spouse's review or they just want to think about it, um, we can share um, the moment the moment they left where they're at that transaction, we can share it with them, um, and it comes as a text message to their phone and they click on it and it brings up the exact deal that we that they, that they left with. Right. Trade value, payoff, um, payment, rate, all of it. So for us, it's truly, it's truly how we do business, whether right. um, they're in store or, uh, or out of store, and it makes it really easy for us to train people as well. Because all our automotive advisors, they sell cars with a tablet and nothing else. They don't use paper, um, and it's all done literally online. And customers like it. I watch them all the time. They just they look at an iPad together. We have kiosks um, at all three of my stores, and. Um, I have to tell you that customers like it. No matter if it's going to be your whole process or just a tool, I can tell you that people are um, the public, and, and I deal with people a lot on a daily basis. I'm pretty active and pretty active dealer. Customers like it. They like the transparency. They like not having um, you know a quote unquote car salesman walk back and forth to uh, a manager behind a glass somewhere who's a, a mystery man or woman. Um, you know, they hate that. Because the first thing that they do when the salesman gets up is they start looking at their phones. Um, and, and they start doubting. And then they start not trusting. Um, so for us, again, it's it's our entire process. The trade appraisal, um, payment presentation, F&I presentation, it's, it's, it's our entire process in our store. Great. Great, great, great. So I think as we're moving through this, you know, we have our tool. We've installed it. Now we have our team bought in and all of these gentlemen are talking about that struggle with changing your process. And that's what I really want to, hopefully we can chat about is thinking about your process. Everything needs to be flexible. To Todd's point is that the customer wants it, it's almost, and, and, and Gina said it, we reverse engineer. So if you think about it, if you're going down this road, what do I want that experience to be? If I shut my eyes and picture it in my head and go, this is what I really want, open your eyes and go, ooh, we're not there. And you're going to have struggles. I think the biggest thing that I'm seeing is that disconnect of, well, we can talk about online, but when we come in, how do we transition into the store to pick up where they left off, what you just said, versus we go backwards. The minute we go backwards to do the typical car buying process or sales process, we lose faith with them because we promised them this, we gave them a tool to do this, and we spent a half an hour or 45 minutes doing all of this, and we come in here and you ignored me. So again, thinking through all of your processes, how do you communicate? All of your text messages, your phone calls, your email, everything has to change to communicate the value of this tool, but you have to deliver on it. And that's why, again, all of them were saying is that, yes, we can train, 
you have to make sure that you long term. Todd just said it. I stay in touch with the customers. I'm getting feedback. Are we delivering on this? And you have to keep tweaking it because your salespeople. Any change we talked about it yesterday. Any change, people are going to fight it. The invisible, the invisible horses that are pulling you and going, ah, I don't know. And you have to own it. All of you said it. Leadership top down. I have to own it long term because every time I see change, first month everybody's on board because it's a new great idea. Yay! Second month, the invisible horses come. I'm not sure if this works. I don't think it's as good as it used to be. I want to go back to the old way. You have to fight through that to move into that third and fourth and fifth and sixth month where then it becomes, this is how, to your point, this is how we do business. And I agree with you. I think it's easier to hire people when I can show them and say, this is what we do. Here's what we do. Can you do that? Yes, we can. Great. Come aboard. I don't like to do that. Then you can't work it. We, we turned over uh, 90% of uh, our sales team. Let me, let, me touch, let me touch on that for a minute. What was, the, was it their inability to understand what you wanted or commitment to do it when you say you just turned over 90%? They didn't believe. Um, they didn't believe that selling one price would work. Um, they didn't believe in being transparent with customers. They were car guys and car gals and car dogs, if you want to call them, whatever you want to call them. So now we have a completely different culture and a completely different group of people um, in my company, and I would never, ever go back to the way we were before, ever. Michael, do you find the same thing now that did you turn over staff? Did you – you can attract a different type of employee now with this, or was it just, no, my people are tenured, they believe in me, and you're sort of the you know, unicorn? And it's a combination of all of them. Uh, right. We have, we have some uh, – but we have customers that don't want to do digital business. We still have customers that come in that have purchased 10 cars from one person and would never consider doing that. So there's no one solution that, right. that, that works. And we had really good success with that young millennial, the delivery specialist, and he became a, a digital experience manager. And that's who's managing that, uh, that online uh, 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 experience right now. And that, that yields good fruit. But we still have salesmen on the floor that right. you know, have, have appointments that come in. I, that's my biggest takeaway is that, you know, with all due respect to the vendors, there is no one-size-fits-all solution, mm -hmm. and there is no one-size-fits-all process that works. Every rooftop, every situation is different. You, you really have to be agile. Great. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a very valid point of understanding as you're going into this, I, I would don't want to speak for the four gentlemen here, but I would think that if you have to be very self-aware of who you are as a company, how you do business, what type of staff that I have, because are you willing to turn over 90% of your staff? Are you willing to do that for the long-term benefit? Right? Do you believe in it? And, or can I get people to adapt on this? Right. So I think that as you pick a tool, there's a lot of great tools, you have to know what's going to work for my team. And so those are questions I would think you would be asking vendors. Here's my situation. Here's what I want to do. Does your tool do that? Right? Um, so we got our tool. We've installed. Got our team bought in. We've adapted some processes. The next key I want to talk about, and Gino and Jared, I want your feedback on this, is how do we market to our consumer base so we have the tool? What's in it for them? Right? How do we tell them? Because it isn't just Brian wrote an article a long time ago about, or maybe a month ago, calling it Feel the Dream. It isn't just let's put it on the website and they will come. If they don't know what it is, why I should do it, you're not really helping them. So, Jared, you got the mic. Market. What did you guys do? So, again, recommending. If you do this, you better do this in terms of marketing. So, I will say this is one of the biggest mistakes we did was marketing. So we had launched the tool, we were two weeks in, and we launched a full-blown campaign at one of the stores in Columbus. And it was still in that infancy piece, weren't 100% sure, drove a lot of traffic, we had a lot of people, but it was not a, everything we were branding and we're talking about, it didn't carry over to in-store because the staff wasn't 100% trained. So that was one of the biggest mistakes that we made there. So do you recommend, just on that point then, do you recommend not marketing until you really have it set? Or are you saying, well, we'll figure it out at the same time? I mean, you know, right. everybody's anxious. I got a tool. I want to yeah. tell everybody. 
No, so we, when we launched the Toyota store down in Naples, we did a slow roll in terms of marketing. We didn't even start marketing it until day 31. And that was just the only marketing we were doing there was changing the auto attendant on the phone, announcing Jermaine Express, building you know, content on the website, and just kind of putting it out there. The next month, we added the video and included social ads and included into you know, banners and more awareness. And then we've added the service drive. So we had the kiosk. We added the, you know, we have stanchions with um, carpet. Just like when you go here to check in at the Marriott, if you're a Marriott member, you have a specific lane you go to and check in. We have that same piece now at the store, but we're started in November and we're just now to this point. We found by doing it that way, even though, yes, it's a time piece. The overall experience has been a lot better for the consumers because it's not all at one time. Everybody's trained, knows how to handle it, knows how to ask and what to say. And we started seeing a lot better results. So, Gina, talk about uh, marketing. What were the things, again, what would you recommend everybody to think about in terms of, you know, Gary just says, don't go too fast. But what were you, what did you do? What did you, Hello? Hey, thank God. Uh, I was like, that's not me. Um, what did you think about? And what were mistakes or things or recommendations in terms of marketing this to your consumer well, base? First of all, it's not a, um, a complete omni-channel experience yet because it's really O2O. You know, it's online to offline. So to this point, you have to have your staff bought in. You have to have them be able to, to fulfill the commitment of what you're advertising that's out there. And, and I understood that. You know, I went to a, a couple of different conferences. Brian's, you know, got the one that I can literally see outside my window down in, in, in West Palm. In Palm Beach, and uh, what I look, what I took back from that conference was that I, this has to be an educational experience, not only for your staff but also for your consumers. So we went to the drawing board and put together a 90-second video, which I think you guys saw uh, two days ago, and uh, it kind of talks about the stages in which the customer can use the tool, uh, and then your tool has to be uh, really uncomplicated. You know, I was a nose guard in college, so like a nose guard has to be able to use it. Your grandmother has to be able to use it. Right. If I grab somebody from the wash bay, they have to be able to use it. Um, if they can't, then uh, you need to have, uh, to Mike's point, you have to have a, a vendor that's very flexible with you. You have to have somebody who's willing to do customization. Uh, you don't have to do best price, at least in what we've seen so far, but you have to have an upfront price. Uh, which means that you have to have a market-based price that's out there. Um, you know, for us, in a high lease penetrated market, it's, you can lose the customer in best price for $10 a month, right? And, uh, and you just say, it's best price, sorry. Um, you know, and we've gone through the journey uh, of doing the marketing to where now we use that video and we use uh, a company uh, called Carfilm App, which gives us an underlay. Uh, for the VDP, so we'll send a text message with that video out to every single one of our customers, letting them know that it works. Uh, Active Engage is our, our, our texting company, and they'll communicate directly with the consumer who's on our website. Um, but as far as you know, going out to market with a big television splash or a big radio splash, I think we're going to stay kind of a little bit more in the in the OTT world or in the pre-roll video world, uh, and, and try to. You know, that's where that customer wants to be anyways. I, I don't know if, like, spending much money on TV would work. So right. there's some grain of store marketing, but I think guerrilla marketing really works well. And then educating your customers, you know, whether they're in the service lane or there's somebody that you have on the phone. Uh, we've had a really good experience uh, by, you know, taking these third-party aggregators and then, you know, driving the conversation over the phone uh, and then walking the customer through. But it's really an educational piece right now for your customers. So, so Todd, Todd, how did you do the in this concept of what Gino and Jared were saying? What were the things that worked or what didn't work in terms of educating the consumer of this is a new way that we do business to get them excited about it? Because, again, I'm always a fan of if I, if it, if it, if I don't have a benefit, if I don't know the benefit of doing this, is this just another new thing that a car dealer came up with? So what, would, what worked, what didn't work in terms of the marketing to win people over to this? So when we, when we started with Online Shopper a couple of years ago, um, we really marketed it a lot. Um, we spent a lot of money in TV uh, in my market. We have half-hour infomercials. Um, so we had screenshots 
um, how it worked. Um, we walked the customer through how the exact process would work with online shopper. Um, and then as we evolved and we went to one price, we completely changed all of our marketing, um, I mean, all together. Um, it was about our culture, about our company, how we're transparent, how we're up front. Um, we communicated it, uh, again, through half-hour infomercials, through shorter videos. I think um, we showed, you know, one of the videos uh, the other morning um, through um, our agency. Um, email blasts to our customers. Um, from the moment they walk into the showroom, there's there's kiosks um, on the wall. There's there's um, iPad Pros on different tables. Um, there's iPad Pros in the, in the service departments in the waiting areas. Um, you know, when we advertise, um, anytime we advertise, no matter how we advertise, no matter what the medium is, whether it's uh, through digital, through a Facebook ad, through Instagram ad, through TV, radio, um, we always tell people that, uh, you know, you can, you can buy a car online. Right. Um, if you choose to, or you can start the process online and, and finish it in store. Um, we offer home delivery. Um, we I bought a trailer. Um, we we put graphics all over it. We we filmed it um, delivering cars to people's houses. Um, we put it on Facebook. Um, we put it on Instagram. Uh, we put it on LinkedIn. Um, we've done a lot of marketing. We're just honestly getting started. Great. So, Michael, for you. <coughs> We talk a lot about the marketing. The other three gentlemen were talking a lot about pushing out. What what type of marketing in store, right? What happens when somebody walks in? Is there something in the store that dealers should be thinking about? Because again, <clears throat> excuse me, when we talk about marketing, we have this tendency of like, ah, message out. But when we come in the store, sometimes there's a disconnect. So do inside your store, is there something that lets someone know yeah, you're here, and here's our process, or kiosks, or whatever you're doing. What what did you put in place that helps people? Uh, either it, it, it mentions it to them, or it starts a conversation. Um, what talk about that in the store? What did you market? We put a, a lounge in with a big screen with a workstation, and uh, we take people there to uh, self-configure to build their own. Um, it, uh, you know, sometimes the client advisors will do it at their best with an iPad, but the lounge is where people really get educated, especially in commercial business, people that haven't been to the store to the site before. Right. So they sit there and they explore and they work through it on their own, and you know, people like to drive. So they get they get familiar with it and they get, uh, they, they get the transparency that they're looking for while they're on the floor. Great. So, again, I want to make sure we're, you know, tangible things that you can do. We've talked about the message. We've talked about what's in it for them. We've, Jared, we have a separate lane <clears throat> so that somebody goes, what's that? And I think a lot of what we're talking about here is if we're going to change perceptions of cars and the car buying process, no matter what we say out there in the message, if when we come into the store, if we're not delivering on it or we don't physically see it, Enough to turn around, you have a lounge. My God, a lounge. People are, what, what are they doing over there? Oh, let me explain that to you. What's that? What does that mean? Uh, Germain Express. What's that? I want to be part of that, right? So I think all of these pieces from the tool, picking the right tool for your culture, to getting it configured, to getting your team, I think the biggest, I uh, hear it from manufacturers, I hear it from the, the team out there and from your vendors is this point of installation, right? Implementation. That's longer term. And really taking all of these pieces to make sure you are delivering what you want for your consumer. Because ultimately, to Todd's point, they like it. They like it. So if we're going to go out there and say, we're making it easier for you and faster, and we're throwing obstacles at people all the time because we're fighting. And to Jared's point, it takes time. So please, if I can give you anything, don't think, and I'm sure you guys will uh, validate that, don't think this is going to happen tomorrow. Don't think you're going to sign up with tool A, and they're going to put it on your website, B, and yay, we're selling more cars and it's easier. This is a fight because we're changing how we're doing things. So you're changing the car dogs to maybe I flip people over because they're not bought in. Or maybe you do have people who are bought in. Or all of you guys are saying, hey, I'm changing perspective and I'm fighting egos and I'm taking, this could impact somebody's money. How I make money. 
But ultimately, if we're saying what's best for our customers, you're going to have to go through some of those struggles. And it's not easy. So, again, I don't want anybody to think, oh, that sounds fun. Look, they made it through. I'm sure they got the battle scars underneath and a few extra gray hairs from going through this because it's not easy to change, not just your team, but your willingness to say, this could impact mine as an owner, your bottom line. This is a gamble for some people, but it's a commitment to say, here's what we're doing. So again, the point of this is to say, hey, veterans who have gone through some of these things, here's a couple things you got to pay attention to. You are going to have fights with some of your people. You potentially could lose some of your best salespeople because they do not want to comply. You are going to market the stuff, and some works and some doesn't. You're going to try things, and they go, ooh, that. But long term, you still think from what Todd said, the customers like it. you got to fight through some of this. So, final piece, of course, everybody wants to know, how did it impact the results? Car sales. I want all of you to answer this, right? How did it impact? Was it more efficient, quicker, right? That's the other thing that one of the things we want to make sure we're tracking is if I have a person who walks up on the lot and they don't have an appointment, how long does it take my process to sell? If somebody comes in through a different lead source and they have an appointment, how long does that take? And now I have this thing, what's the time frame? Did I save time? Were my salespeople able to handle more customers quicker? Could I get people in and out in an hour? And that was great. So, Todd, why don't you start? How did it impact your business from from here now and where you project? Like, bottom line results. Quicker, faster, better, more? More efficient? So, we're selling more cars. Uh, We're selling them faster. My new car business is off a little bit, but I don't think it's related to... um, this conversation. Right. Um, out of 40 salespeople, the four that stayed that were um, from the past, um, they're my top performers. Um, most of them were selling in the old days 15, 20 cars a month. They're now selling between 30 and 40 cars a month. They can handle people a lot faster. Um, they're happier. Um, from a customer's point of view, they're in and out of the dealership a lot quicker. Um, from an online standpoint, um, they're, they don't have all these silly buttons and silly forms and have to leave their name to get a trade-in value. And the only thing that they really need to know is, is the car available or not? And we, we can do that online as well. We have a deal pending um, icon. We have a reserve, a reserve now icon so people know whether or not the vehicle is available or not. Um, it's, it's changed my business completely, 100%. Great. Michael, how about you? So the store that embraces this this most uh, sells about 250 cars a month. About five to six percent of those are are uh, are, are online. Um, well, no, there's more than that that are online that are digital retail. Right. Um, we don't see the customers finish; they go right to the end and stop, and then they come in. But when we survey those customers, they have the least amount of concerns with the negotiation process, with the business office, with the time of delivery. Um, they're happier. And the biggest uh, uh, surprise to me was uh, we're a really competitive lease market also. And um, so everybody said, oh, you know, you're going to have to price those cars and you're going to lose gross on those cars. We make $300 more a car on, on those cars. So we do, you know, between 15 and 18 a month, and they're normally uh, better grosses than before. So overall, it's a win. You know? Uh, you know, for our store, uh, at least at Lakeland, I can give you, and, and also at British Motor Course, it does the full experience, because some of our stores have the widget, but they don't have the full experience. Mm-hmm. Um, those stores, uh, at least from the F&I standpoint, have gone up dramatically. Our Lakeland store went from uh, sub $1,000 a copy, and now they're almost $2,000 a copy. And uh, they went from about 113% product penetration to 233 So from a financial outcome, it's been awesome, uh, just to say the least. Um, and then the experience for the customer is better, and we really can fulfill the commitment of getting customer in and out. Uh, for the stores that have had the widget without, you know, the full process, we've seen uh, at least here in the California area for first deal at our uh, Jaguar Land Rover store in Stevens Creek. Customer came in, it was a uh, pretty awesome deal. And uh, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty satisfied. Uh, you know, when we looked at the tool, again, because 
the gym variable for a couple cups of coffee, and, and I hadn't seen a tool like this from my F&I side, uh, which, you know, it gives you great uh, reporting. Uh, but we also took people who were sophomoric at best and put them on the tool, and we started to see, you know, some of the, the increases. And uh, because of that tool, I wanted to be able to push customers into that tool faster. And uh, that's what the, the digital retail tool did for us. It's like I, I, I bypassed the CRM desking tool. I bypassed the, you know, there's so many disjointed friction points when you, when you do it the old way. Right. And uh, we eliminated a lot of that. It's just one seamless process. You know, um, and it's been great. I mean, it really has been great. We're, we're, we're excited to, to kind of implement it a little bit further with some of our higher volume stores. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure everybody on the panel can tell you there's less and less customers. That, you know, the up bus has definitely stopped. Um, so we're going to have to go out and be creative and find ways to sit with customers at Starbucks or at their office or at their home. And, uh, you know, having an omni-channel experience is probably going to give us a leg up on the rest of our, our competition. So. That's what I'm really excited about. It. You know, we're at the beginning of the beginning of this. This right. isn't even, you know, the cake is barely, you know, done. Like, we haven't even mixed the bowl yet. The eggs right. haven't been broken. So, just be vulnerable and open to uh, criticism would be the number one thing, too, I would say. Yeah. You know, we, as Gina was just mentioned, the online, just the widget base, you know, we've seen good success. We've got, I would say, better quality in terms of engagement compared to somebody who's just been clicking his CTA, which we've been talking about, you know, all week. So we're getting a lot better quality of those consumers because they're people who are really in market. Um, with the widget, we have actually kind of adjusted our, some of our in-store processes. So, you know, you get the guy who wants to get a sign on the trade appraisal. We don't bid them anymore. We push them back into the digital retailing tool as the approximate. We have them engage it with that side. Um, if, you know, they want more payment ideas, same thing. If you phone up, we walk them through it and have them engage there. We've seen better results because of that um, from the widget piece. But both the online and in-store, you know, down at the Toyota store down in Florida, we've had great success. Um, I mean, we're still very new into it. As I said, we launched in November. Right. Um, but the biggest piece is now is watching the salespeople and just – Seeing what happens when, you know, one of them forgets to plug in their iPad overnight and their iPad dies and they're freaking out now because they have, you know, they're stopped. They can't do anything. They right. can't move forward. So it's really cool to see that experience of it because it just shows you it's not just a widget. It's not just a tool. It's really starting to become the culture. Great. So that's the, the real rewarding piece for me to see it on that side. You great one. Yeah, I wanted to just yeah, say yeah, a couple yeah. things. Um, so my son's 17, and he started selling cars for me uh, last year. He's done a lot of other jobs in the dealership, too, um, from mopping floors and cleaning up cigarette butts to um, selling cars. Um, he came into the dealership with me about a month and a half ago on a Saturday, and we were slammed, um, and he wasn't supposed to, quote-unquote, work that day. Um, he sold two cars in about an hour and 20 minutes to two people because we were so busy um, using our express store. Um, uh, he's 17 years old. Um, and then we've been able to do two. Um, I talked about turnover. We're hiring people now from Best Buys, uh, from Verizon stores, AT&T stores, um, people that have no car business experience whatsoever. They're just nice people um, that know how to use technology. And they're, we train them in five days, um, and they sell cars like that. Um, and even the newbies are selling at least 12, 13, 14 cars a month, like the first month that they start out typically. Even the ones that don't totally embrace it or get it are they're eight or nine cars a month just to start. And I think that's a factor, too. Um, look at the labor pool. It's not getting any bigger. We all know this, right? Um, you have to be able to attract talent. You have to attract not millennials just to sell cars, too, but millennials to actually sell cars um, and having a, a, a digital um, retail process. Uh, in your store um, allows you to um, hire just different kinds of people all together. And I think B1 price actually helps with that as well. Great. So as we, I want to open it up to the floor in a moment. Um, so as we wrap up, we've talked about the tool, install, people, marketing, results. Just to wrap up, one word of advice, the biggest thing that anyone going down this journey they have to think about 
the biggest one that either a mistake you made or don't even go down this road unless you're willing to do this, what would you say? Go all in. Either just go in 100%. If you go in half-baked, it's not going to work. You have to be open-minded. Um, whatever, you know, whatever worked before is, um, has no relevance and every process, every tool, every person uh, has to go into this with an objective mindset. I mean, we're, we're in uncharted waters. So the, the word I would put out there is persistence. You know, there's going to be a lot of landmines on your journey, mm-hmm. uh, but learn from them fast. And, and, you know, I know a lot of us that are in here, we have this, like, you know, disease of righteousness sometimes. We think that we always have the right answers. Uh, be vulnerable to being completely wrong. Uh, and, and listen to your people because they're the ones that are going to be using the tool. And, that, and, and you know, that's how your tool is going to get better. Yeah. A couple things. Um, communica- communication is key. And not just internally with your team, with your managers, with your salespeople, but feedback from your customers is critical. And first month after we surveyed 30 people who had bought through process and got their feedback. And we can consistently do it now every month and just pick 30 at random just to get their feedback of, you know, was it everything they expected? Right. What can we do better? Right. Um, and don't be afraid to fail. I mean, don't be afraid to fail and fall down. You're, it's going to happen. But at the end of the day, the light at the end of the tunnel is going to help us long term. So I want to uh, open it up. I want to hear some questions from you for the panel. Hey, so, um, this question is for all four of you. Did you change any of your compensation plans in sales, and sales management, and or F&I? Oh, good question. Everybody who touches digital retailing has a different pay plan. Um, all the pay plans have to change. None of them would have worked in their in their uh, original configuration. Yeah, we changed pay plans. Um, well, the, two of our stores, we don't have finance managers anymore, so that was, you know, an area that we could take. We didn't have to give all that money back to the operation, but we took some of it and put it back to the salespeople. So if you want to talk about retention, um, you know, we sell a lot of IHG cards, and gross compression is definitely a... Uh, Part of the deal, and uh, it, it paying salespeople minis. That's you know, I was listening to him talk about ninety percent uh, turnover. Well, I mean, the industry average right now is like seventy percent, I think. So, um, the only way that we can retain uh, our sales staff is by giving them new avenues in which they can make money, and then you get the ancillary benefit. Is that's what the customer wants? They don't want to go through a four stage process, uh, and uh, the salespeople that we have. To Todd's point, we had a kid that literally was, I think he was stocking shelves at Costco, and now he's $2,200 a copy, and I'm going to compensate him on that. I'm going to compensate the sales managers, too, who used to pencil all the deals, and 70% of the income that the F&I manager was making uh, was coming from the desk in the first place. So, yeah, change change your pay plans and incentivize the the right behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, it's a great question. Because that's one of the things that part of the reason why we failed out of the gate was because we didn't make the adjustments. So it's a critical point of the transition if you're going to embrace this as part of your culture. You have to take a step back and see, is this going to work in compensation? So 100%. We have changed pay plans both for you know sales, for F&I, for desk, for e-com team. Um, even the GM threw it out there. He goes, listen, this, I'm bought into it. I'm going to take an adjustment to my pay from this as well. So it was good to see that, you know, you know Brian Niff and, you know, how he is. And he went all in. He goes, listen, I'm right here with you. I told me too. So. We changed them all. All of them, including fixed stops. Um, pick stops now, um, some of the bonus is based on how quick we can get car delivered to a customer, um, which helps. Yeah, we changed all variable ops, paper and changed, everything changed. Uh, another question, yes. Uh, 
So, yes, to my advisors, yes. My, my, my individual advisors. So they're they're paid flats um, per card that they sell, and they get bonus they get bonuses based on hitting certain levels, and they get flats based on F and I products that they sell as well. Um, so you know a, a person in my organization they also have uh, they get a base salary now that's not a draw, so they get five hundred dollars a week salary no draw, and um, they're basically paid per car a flat. Um, if they're considered a senior automotive advisor, they have to um, have a minimum of 17 deals rolled over three months. They're senior, their flats are higher. Um, so my guy that sells 35 to 40, he will probably make 110,000, maybe 120 uh, this year. Someone who sells uh, 15 to 17 cars a month will probably make um, 60 to 70, depending on how they do with F&I products. Um, in the past, how we used to pay, and we used to pay on gross, um, people that were selling 15, 16, 18 cars a month were making 100 grand. Um, people that were selling seven or eight cars a month, if they could gross, they were still making um, 50 or 60, um, and it promoted people to honestly be lazy. So, Another question. Okay, got one here. So, first of all, thank you guys for sharing all your experience. This has been hugely valuable for me. I've just been jotting down notes like crazy. Um, wanted to just share, we've, we've been coming into digital retailing with the belief that since form submission rates are on a decline, that this is actually going to be more valuable for us as an in-store process than on, online. Want, now that you're involved in this and, and you're in the trenches with it, would you would you say that that's the right belief or would you think about it differently? Um, so go first. Um, so we chose we we chose to push all of our traffic um, to Roadster um, online and in store both. Um, and I we're five months into it now, and we've seen nothing but success. Uh, I don't think you can give a customer something uh, an experience at home or work or on their phone the one way, and then have it be totally different when they walk into the you know when they walk into the dealership. So. Um, no, I don't have any regrets of doing it that way at all, not at this point anyways. Yeah, we're five months in, but so far it's going pretty well. So we're in a very heavy lease penetration market, so a lot of our, about half of, more than half is portfolio replacements. So those new customers, they get introduced to that lounge so that they'll get familiar with the tool and um, they received it really well. All the incremental business goes there, but going forward, yeah, we probably would make it a part of the showroom process and all the stores. We're still learning. Yeah, so we're testing a bunch of different uh, areas in which we're looking at form submissions. So I think that was where you were going with it. Um, you know, we've looked at it where it's a pre-lead right up front. You can't even get into the tool without having to, you know, get through the gauntlet. And we get a lot of Mickey Mouses and things of that nature. Uh, we've moved it back from the first click to right before you get the payment. So it's like, oh, you're almost there. And, and we've done it where we're wide open at some stores. Um, so we're right in the middle of that. So if you're looking for more leads, because I got a guy Bob, he loves leads, and uh, th there's an opportunity for more leads. But if you have a pretty good digital agency, you can also, you know, reverberate your messaging by tagging your digital tool so that you can retarget that customer uh, in different avenues to kind of push them back in. And if you have a really good attribution partner, they can tell you what's going on also with with that tool. So. There's, for us, we're kind of in the middle of it. We don't know what works best. Um, but, yeah, form submissions are down. I mean, that's just, it's natural. People are tired of it. If you want to have real fun, uh, uh, take one of your friend's phone numbers and put it into one of those moving storage places, and you'll see why form submissions are down. It would be like 15 to 20 phone calls. <laughs> no, absolutely. So we're, we've kind of done the testing and, you know, the, beauty of where we're at, we actually have two Lexus stores in Columbus. So we can literally do A-B testing with one store having on and one store having, you know, CTAs and, you know, that's the, that piece as well. We noticed that the leads are down without the CTAs, but the quality is a lot better. So it, you know, they have to take a step back and figure out, you know, what is your goal? What is your goal for a store? Is it to get more leads, is it to try and transact online? Is it to just 
have retention of customers? You know, what is your guys' goal as a store? And once you can answer that question, you know, you can kind of see what angle you need to uh, really approach it at. Great. So, so just to summarize again, going down this path, thinking about before you even get started, why am I going down to what you just said? What, what, what's, the, what's my end goal? What am I trying to deliver to my customers? Finding that right tool, asking the right questions of how does this tool work for me? What can I get, right? And for, instead of just latching it on the site and we go, eh. and then how do we win our people over? How are we marketing out to our consumers? And the biggest thing I took away is that concept of you're going to fail. It's going to hurt. It's okay. Dust yourself off. Figure it out. Because if your ultimate goal is I want to serve my customers, it, we're all learning. And I want to thank all four of you for sharing, uh, you know, some of your struggles, giving the tips. They're here all day. So, again, we could sit here and chat all day about this. But I'm sure if you have any questions, they'll be more than happy to chat with you and talk about it. So, again, I'd really love if you give these four gentlemen a great round of applause. And thank you all very much. Hi, this is Brian Pash, founder of PCG Companies. And I'm glad that you enjoyed some of the excerpts from the Digital Marketing Strategies Conference in the beautiful Napa Valley. Coming up in November is the Automotive Analytics and Attribution Summit. It's in beautiful Palm Beach, Florida. It's November 17th, 18th, and 19th. I encourage you to go to the website, Automotive Attribution Summit, and purchase your tickets. Last year, we sold out. This conference is available to dealers, OEMs, and automotive industry leaders on the vendor side, developer side, or analyst side of the business. Remember, we have a special rate at the Breakers Hotel, and it's important that you book early because we have a limited block of rooms, and since so many of the activities are happening at the Breakers, you wouldn't want to miss staying at the hotel and being able to conveniently attend the cocktail receptions, the workshops, the keynotes, and the special events. Keep in mind that those of you who'd like to come a day early, we have a full day Google Analytics certification class, and for the first time this year, for data-driven automotive professionals, we're going to have some specific training on Google Tag Manager and Google Data Studios. So make sure that you make your reservations for both your tickets and your hotel as soon as possible.